hallelujah. I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll be saying a lot of hallelujah, right? Amen. But it's definitely great to be here this morning. Hope you guys uh, had a good week. I know that I had uh, a so-so week. I'm not too much of a fan of the cold. You know, usually back in my young days, my hair would be all shaved off. <laughs> it would be all shaved off. But believe me, man, wow. I'm afraid to cut my hair now. That's why you see me have the little fro going there. <laughs> Seriously afraid to cut my hair. Even when I cut my hair, and even when I put a hat on, my head is still cold. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go as far as I can until my wife says enough is enough. <laughs> then I'll cut it. <laughs> so we'll see how far I can go. But it's great to be here. It's great. I want to give a very uh, warm welcome to uh, Fumi's husband, Gabriel. <clears throat> Gabriel is no stranger to us. He's coming from a very, very hot place. I'm going to talk to him later to see how he likes the, the, the winter. <laughs> He's like, no, I don't like the winter. But hey, amen, it's great to have everyone here. This morning, I want to uh, do a message called The Workers in the Vineyard. I think, uh, you know, it's a very fitting message as we are looking to the new year. We are in the new year, but we're looking for, uh, to do great things for God in the new year. Uh, let us turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter uh, 19 in verse 27. And it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Sorry, starting in verse 23, but with God, all things are possible. Verse 27, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the son of man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12, on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And anyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Amen? But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. You know, so, you know, obviously we see Peter here. He's always the one to speak up, isn't he? He's always the one to kind of get himself in trouble. But with Peter, he was, he was a real guy. And, you know, we learned a lot from Peter because we find, too, that we're a lot like Peter. I'm a lot like Peter. I'm always, my mouth is sometimes always getting me in trouble, right? But afterwards, I kind of tend to learn from the things that I say, shouldn't have said. <clears throat> You know, but he wanted to find out what reward would be given for those who give up everything for Jesus. You know, and Jesus reassures them that their, pla that their place in the kingdom at the renewal of all things. He reassured them that anyone who has left homes, brothers or sisters, fathers or mothers or children or fields, he reassures them that they will receive a hundred times as much. Their quality of life will be great. A hundred times better in this age, and in the end, they will inherit eternal life. But he said, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. You know, and sometimes this kind of confuses us, doesn't it? Many who are first will be last, and then, you know, he does it the opposite. Sometimes confuses us, but I'll get into that later. You know, so Jesus, you know, because of the question that Peter asked, you know, Jesus goes on, as he often does, to teach them something that they need to learn. And he goes on to teach them some more mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So let's start again in, uh, in verse, uh, tw uh, chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, for the kingdom of heaven 
is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his, wine, into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told, he, he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing around here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the, uh, with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men were hired last, work only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the, and, and the heat of the day. But he, but he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Don't, don't, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was, who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. You know, the landowner who went out early to hire men represents God. And if, uh, in case you don't know yet, we are the workers in the vineyard, okay? <laughs> the disciples of Jesus are the workers in the vineyard. You know, so the landowner, you know, went out at 6, 6 a.m. Wow, I don't know if I owned a business, if I would actually be waking up that early. <laughs> but this guy, he went out at 6 a.m. You know, we see him going out at the third hour, 9 a.m., to get more people to work. You know, and this time he does not promise them a denarius for the day, but only that he would pay them what is right. He went out again at the sixth hour, which is obviously 12 noon, to get some more people. In verse 6, this time he goes out at the 11th hour, which is at 5 o'clock in the evening. This time the landowner does not make a contract with them. He mentions nothing about pay, only that they, would that they would come and work in his vineyard. These guys that came at 5 o'clock would not be expecting much. Would you agree? Yeah, they wouldn't be expecting much. They, they would be like, what? Damn, this, he's probably going to pay me a penny, you know, for working just one hour. They would not be expecting that. You would be wondering what is a, you might be wondering, what is the big deal about a vineyard? And why does this landowner require so much people to work? It's not a concept that we can kind of understand in our time. But, but back in those days in Israel, back in that time, a vineyard was huge. It was actually pretty good money to own a vineyard. You know, but this was a common scene in the first century where people would stand around and wait to be hired for a day's work. In a lot of places in our time, it is a very common scene. People still do it to this day. You might not see that in Canada. You'd be like, you see somebody standing out there hiring me with a sign. You'd be just like, what are you doing, man? I think you need to go and get a resume, <laughs> you know, and go on the internet and, you know, do your thing. Get in with the times. You just don't get hired like that anymore, right? You don't. People, are, people think you're crazy. But in some countries, people still do that. They still do it. They, 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 there's a certain place where they go. And, you know, you would get like 20 guys literally lined up. And then, some, and then the, the, the guy that owns the business would be like, you, 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 you. And then they would go. They would know that they're going to be hired for a day's work. It's actually pretty humbling, isn't it? 
But this, but it was a very, very common scene back then. It still happens to this day in certain countries. But in this parable, Jesus is describing literally what it takes to run a vineyard. It is actually, actually a job that requires a lot of manpower in the heat of the summer months. And often, as we see in this parable, more and more workers were usually needed to get the job done. In verse 8, we see that the, the, the concept of the last being first and the first being last. You know, this is a, a specific command from the, uh, fr uh, from the landowner to the foreman to do it this way. When he says, make sure that you do it this way. Don't, don't, don't pay the, 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 the first ones first. Pay the last ones. It was very specific direction. And this is God giving that direction. And remember, we are workers in the vineyard. We are the ones, disciples of Jesus. In verse 9, you know, it's a surprise because the workers who was hired at the 11th hour received a denarius. You know, this was a Roman soldier's pay for one day. It was a denarius. You know, the, the, all the others were in full view of this and was most likely thinking, wow, well, you know what? Wow, this guy is pretty generous. <laughs> This guy is pretty generous. Man, look at him. These guys came at 5 o'clock, and he's paying them a denarius as if they had worked for a whole day. But surprise, surprise. In verse 10. So this is why those who was there from the first hour thought that they would get more, right? Yeah, they thought naturally that they would get more money. They thought that they would get more than a denarius because, man, look at this guy. The, the fifth hour worker, he gave a denarius. So for sure, he's going to give me like maybe two or three denarius. And they're all like fired up, right? Man, I'm going to get paid more. But the whole scene does not seem fair at all. And in fact, it is not fair. So this landowner is very un unconventional. He is most, he's not like most regular landowner. These guys just can't understand him. They have never seen anything like this before. What kind of business is this guy running? <laughs> to treat men who work the hardest and longest in that way. Man, I tell you, if that happened to me, actually that did happen to me. I remember there was one time where uh, I was working and uh, inflation actually went up. And everybody got a 10 cent raise. Woo, huh? <laughs> everybody uh, in my workplace got a 10 cent raise, except for me. And, I, and, and then, you know, people were talking, yeah, 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 you know, I got, look at that, you know, I got a 10 cent raise and because of inflation. And I looked at my check stuff, I'm just like, wait a minute, why didn't I get a 10 cent raise? As if, that's so, as if that is any big money, right? But, but still, you kind of feel that jab, you know? And it happened that I didn't get it because of the time that I had started. Some reason I didn't get it. So people were getting 10 cents more than me for a long time. And believe me, and I was, I was a hard worker. Actually, am, I am. Not was, I am a hard worker. And I felt it. I was like, man, you know what? I want my 10 cents, man. <laughs> Give me my 10 cents. You know, but we all want equality, don't we? We all want equality. But it didn't happen. You know, later on it eventually kicked in and I was, you know, pretty happy about that. But it didn't really make a big dent on my paycheck. But it was just the thought of it that, hey, you know, why should these guys be getting more than me, right? And I, and I, had, I had attitudes, you know, in my heart, you know, when I found it out. You know, but this gives us a hint, though, of what this whole lesson is all about. You see, these guys were complaining that the landowner made the guys who worked one hour more equal to them. They were complaining. He says, man, he made them equal to us. So now the landowner has to defend his position as to why he made them equal. Wow. Have you ever put your boss in that situation? Tell me why, boss. You know, why is it, you know, that I... Where's my 10 cents, you know? How come they get 10 cents and I don't? <laughs> you know, but this parable is not about money. I just want us to know that this parable is not about money. But if we look intently, we will see that this is about God's 
grace and his distribution of it. Oftentimes when we, you know, when we see Jesus, or we, you know, we read and Jesus talks about money, he's not really, you know, there's sometimes that, yes, he's going to the heart of the matter. And he's talking about money, but in this one, he's not talking about money. Look intently into it, and you'll see that it's not about money. But it's about God's grace and his distribution of it. See, Jesus is teaching us here about the grace of God and how it runs. And it is not the way we think that things should be run. That's why these guys had such a big attitude. They're just like, man, what are you doing? What's your thinking? What are you thinking? But, but, but God specifically said, no, pay the last ones first. He did it the other way, trying to teach them a lesson here. You see, the workers had their own idea of pay grade. <laughs> but God has his and its equality. You see, the person that God has called and is a servant in the church for, for seven years will receive the same as a man who was in service for a year, the last hour. See, we're, we're all the same at the foot of the cross, aren't we? None of us is greater than any. None of us. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach them. As I said before, it is very obvious that the servants, that we are the servants. And this is a lesson that we need to learn as disciples of Jesus Christ. See, God administers his grace to us in many ways and in different times in our lives. And we often complain or get attitudes when we see others being blessed. Just like I did when they got the 10 cents raise and I didn't. I'm going to pick on that one. That's a funny one. This is a whole scene, I deserve more reward because I've been around longer. Sometimes that's our attitude. You know, in verse 15, Jesus says, grace belongs to me. Grace belongs to me. And that he has the right to do with it what he pleases. It's all about God. Everything that we have is because of God's grace. If we are a good administrator... It's because of God's grace. If we are a good preacher, a good teacher, a good song leader, a good Bible talk leader, a good minister leader, if we are good with working with kids, serving the poor, if we are good at evangelism in getting people into God's kingdom, it is all because of God's grace and what he has blessed us with. So our attitude should not be like the workers who was hired at the first hour. We all agreed to work for denarius, didn't we? Yeah, we did. That's what Jesus said. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? You see, the rest is up to God to distribute his blessings. See, in the latter part of verse 15, Jesus warns us of the envious heart. And this is something that we have to watch, right? We all get envious at times. I know I do. I'm a human. Every single human being get envious. And if we're, and if we, and if we're gonna say that we don't get envious, hmm, we're not really telling the truth. <laughs> but we all do, we all, we all get envious. We all get jealous. It's, it's, it's a part of our human nature. You know, but the Spirit gives us power to be able to overcome these things in our lives, and we praise the Lord for that. You know, see, when we see people with certain skills and abilities, we should not envy them. In fact, we, don't, we should not even desire to have what they have. You know, we need to be happy for them and delighted to see the grace of God displayed in their lives. I want to say, inspiration, yes. We need to be inspired, right? We, we do inspire one another. But to, to get to the point where sometimes we, we're envious and we want what other people have, whether it be a certain talent. I'm not sure if you guys have ever been there before, you know, but you, you see somebody with an amazing talent. You know, they have the, the I wouldn't say power, but they have the ability to do certain things and you're just like, wow, oh, man, I wish if I was like that. I wish if I could create wealth like Bill Gates. 
I wish I could do this and I wish I could do that. But the Bible says, nope. Jesus says, do not be envious. We always have to watch our hearts. Be inspired, yes, but to be envious, no. We need to focus on the grace of God in our lives. In verse 16, it ends off by saying that this is a meaning of the first being last and the last first. See, while we are here in the flesh, we will experience this effect. But we need to have a proper understanding in the way God distributes his grace. And just like uh, as we read in, in chapter 19, says that when we inherit eternal life, that the last will be first. Those of us in this generation will get our reward first before all the saints of old. Isn't that amazing? If God should come back right now, you would be blessed first. And then everybody else in the past that ever lived who followed the Lord. This is just how God does things. And we need to accept that. So we experience God's grace twofold in the here and now and in the hereafter. So what reward will be given for those who give up everything for Jesus? This is what Peter asked, right? He says, man, we have left everything for you. We have given up everything for you, Jesus. And it's amazing how Jesus answers, eh? He didn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> nope, he didn't say, oh, thank you. But he went on to a, an amazing lesson to really teach them about the heart condition that they need to have. But obviously the answer is everlasting life. We, you know, we give up everything for Jesus, and he will give us everlasting life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You know, it is very true that we will all get different rewards in heaven according to what we have done. But we are all equal when it comes to the gift of eternal life. For the Lord is just and generous. <clears throat> you know, God's grace teaches us that we can't try to control situations. You know, God's grace is very, very vast. There's many aspects to God's grace. If anyone understands God's grace, it will produce something in them. You know, they will have a peace and a trust in God that is extraordinary. You just can't explain it. A person who understands God's grace does not get easily offended when people sin against them. Because they too know that they also have been forgiven by the precious blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? See, my prayer is that this year, that we will grow in our understanding of God's grace. And that we will see how deep and wide is the grace of God. And that it is real. Okay? It is so real. The grace of God is amazing. It is so real. And that it should be applied and understood properly in our lives. We should make that our goal. You know, I believe that, you know, the, the, the Bible is called the, the Holy Bible. But I, I believe that there should have been something else added to it. The Holy Bible of God's grace. You know, and it's, and it's something that, as people, we struggle with. We struggle with the grace of God. We struggle with giving and showing people the grace of God. Why? Because we don't really understand it. We don't understand the power of it. And as what I said, it needs to be understood properly. And this is something that before I had no idea what it was when I first became a Christian. I didn't even know what pride was. I was just like, Whoa, what's pride? Don't get offended, but I was like, yeah, I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> kind of thing. I had no idea. What is it? You know, I thought that's what pride was. You're proud of yourself and that kind of thing. You know, but I, and I did not know what grace was. And I did not give it. I did not show it. 
did not show grace. But it was over a period of time, you know, that I kept reading the scriptures. And all through the, the New Testament, you, you know, you see Paul talking about God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. And it finally hit me one day, and I grasped it, and I said, oh, my goodness. Wow. This is amazing. There's nothing greater. Nothing greater than the, the grace of God. What he's shown to us is mercy, is unmerited mercy that he's shown towards us. Nothing. And as I said, my prayer is that we will grow in the grace of God. And you will know when you're growing in the grace of God. You will know it will be manifested in you. Somebody will, somebody will cut you off on the road, and you know, you, you're going to get angry. And then you're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, last week I cut somebody off on the road too. And then you're going to be like, calm down, be gracious. You know, somebody's going to say something to you. You know, perhaps Donald Trump is going to make some kind of comment that uh, <laughs> you're just like, wow, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with certain things in life? Things that people say. God, it's, it is through God's grace. Because Jesus Christ died for you. And because he died for you, this, that's the only way to deal with this world. It's grace. But I want us to remember, we have an eternal life that is coming to us. And it is awesome. It is precious. And I pray that we are looking forward to that great day where we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Amen. <laughs>